My name is Carol Frierson Campbell, and I'm a music education professor from William Patterson University in Wayne, New Jersey, about 20 miles or 30 kilometers west of New York City in the United States. It is a great pleasure and honor to be part of this virtual conference. I'd like to thank Susan O'Neill for the invitation to give this presidential lecture and also to thank Ismay for envisioning a way for this international music education community to continue its work during this very difficult time. I began my career as a music educator in the small town of Corning in upstate New York, where I taught children to play instruments in the public schools. After some years, and after completing the PhD, I moved to Wayne, New Jersey, where I now teach music education at the collegiate level. In my first year in New Jersey, a chance encounter at an inner city school led to my interest in urban music education. And that interest led to my being invited to meet Mona and Bassam Hishme. They're a Palestinian American couple who live near the university and believe strongly in supporting the arts, particularly for underprivileged children. They invited me to apply for a grant to support an after school outreach program in Patterson, New Jersey's third largest city, and one that is underserved, particularly in terms of arts education. They also invited William Patterson University to, be, to become a partner with the Edward Said National Conservatory of Music, an organization that serves Palestinian youth in cities across the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. Our partnership began when the conservatory invited a faculty jazz quartet for a 10-day tour in March of 2010. I was invited to join, and I went as much out of curiosity as anything. What I observed and encountered there led me to change my thinking about the meanings and purposes of music education, particularly in light of the places where music is taught, learned, and performed, the impact those places have on the experience of music making, and the ways those experiences shape music makers. And that is what I will be talking about today. I call this presentation Musicking in Place, Noticing Musical Becomings in Palestine. I begin with three questions. First, how do the places in which we teach, learn, and perform music impact the experience of musicking? Second, how do these experiences in turn impact our interpretations of the music and of the places? And third, who do we become in the process? Today's presentation is based on ethnographic field worth in Palestine over the course of several visits, including a six month sabbatical residency in the fall of 2015. As a participant observer, I collected musical stories from current and former students, teachers, parents, and administrators while living in the West Bank and serving as one of the many international music teachers at the Edward Said National Conservatory of Music. After this brief introduction, we will visit a few of the places that were important to my research participants. With their experiences, we veer from official interpretations of music and of places into a variety of individual, collective, institutional, and political perspectives. A critical element of this presentation involves noticing musical becomings in the experiences described by participants. Finnish musicologists Moisela, Lapanen, Dienen, and Vatenen suggest that merging Small's notion of musicking, which has to do with taking part in any capacity in a musical performance, and has a K deliberately added to denote action, with Deleuze and Guattari's concept of becoming, 
which has to do with a continuous process of change brought on by what we encounter in our daily lives, can demonstrate how musical becomings emerge for individuals, groups, and institutions as new realities and new understandings motivated by musicking. Noticing involves moving away from certainty regarding what musicking is towards seeking the unexpected, looking and listening behind the screen. Interpreting musical becomings at this time and in this place is complicated by many factors. The everyday realities faced by Palestinian musicers living in the region, the layers of human interaction in cultural institutions, and the fact that this entity sees itself reimagining and rebuilding Palestinian national culture, part of constructing a Palestinian state. It's difficult as an outsider to even perceive all these layers. And yet without noticing them, we miss important becomings. To facilitate our noticing, I close with Georgina Bourne's theory of music sociality, which envisions complex socio-musical contexts as four constantly interacting planes of musical mediation that co-function independently, like a constellation. We first visit Birzeit, which is where most of my visits have begun. It's a small village named for Zeit, or olive oil, about seven kilometers from the Palestinian city of Ramallah in the West Bank. It was in Birzeit that, along with my colleagues, I first encountered the lively and creative musical culture that is a key element of the conservatory's mission. The facade of the, of the Birzeit Activity Center, as you can see, is covered with a fantastical mural that depicts every manner of Arabic and Western musicians poised as if playing a patriotic tune together. While my colleagues offered jazz workshops to high school students from the West Bank and East Jerusalem, I observed their work and visited conservatory branches. On the third evening, we held a concert in Ramallah to celebrate the students' accomplishments. There amidst the proud parents enjoying the evening, I noticed something about music education that I had not noticed before. This experience wasn't only about children learning to perform music. Music making was a way for this community of claiming the right to become who they want to be. And if it was so for this community, it was so for music education everywhere. I had been too busy teaching to notice. The conservatory stayed on my mind long after I returned home. By developing and publishing Western and Arabic music curricula in Arabic, supporting public music festivals across the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem, bringing youth from across the worldwide Palestinian diaspora for international tours with the Palestine Youth Orchestra, and providing jobs for Palestinian musicians and staff, the conservatory had created an infrastructure in Palestine for what Christopher Small calls musicking, defined earlier but worth repeating, taking part in any capacity in a musical performance. According to Small, musicking establishes in the place where it is happening a set of relationships, and it is in those relationships that the meaning of the act lies. But I wondered, what did that mean for the people who taught and learned music at the Edward Said National Conservatory of Music in Palestine? Before we go on, I must acknowledge that at this time it can be difficult to talk about Palestine. The name as well as the land is contested and politically charged. The United Nations and the United States formally refer to this land as the occupied Palestinian territories. Others call it Palestine, the West Bank, or even Judea Samaria, an assumed part of greater Israel. I call the people Palestine, I call the area Palestine and its people Palestinian because that is how the Edward Said Conservatory of Music 
and its clientele refer to themselves and the places they inhabit. I must also acknowledge my gratitude for the hospitality and collegi collegiality shown to me by musicians, administrators, and others from this conservatory over the years. Shukran. With every visit, I notice new musical becomings and my understanding of the experience of Palestinian musicers grows deeper. We next visit the city of Bethlehem familiar to many around the world as the birthplace of Jesus Christ. It's also the place where Mohammed, a woodwind specialist who had recently earned an advanced degree from the Angers Conservatoire, experienced the conflict known as the First Intifada, or uprising. A young child at that time, his reality was home arrest, not moving because there were always soldiers walking the street with their weapons. So it was dangerous. Mohammed told me that as a child, it was not allowed that you talk about the situation or politics because you are part of it. As a kid, you can't take yourself away because you live it. Mohammed's earliest musical inspiration was hearing his neighbor play the nai, the Arabic flute, on his roof at night in defiance of the curfew. For Mohammed, learning music in the conservatory enabled him to express himself. He said, when I play, everyone listens and nobody interrupts me. Mohammed saw the conservatory as trying to open this chance to everyone to learn the music, not only music, but to get involved in the cultural movement which is happening in the Palestinian community. In a way, he said, to be open to the world, but not to forget our roots. Early on, living in this place, Mohammed interpreted music as a powerful mechanism for political resistance. The musical story of May, a flutist I worked with during summer camp in Birzit, also started in Bethlehem. Like Mohammed, May was one of the first students to enroll when the Bethlehem branch of the conservatory opened in 1997. Learning music at that time and in that place made May feel like part of a special group. It also taught her to get along with boys because in schools, they were separated by sex. May talked about how traveling from her village up the hill to Bethlehem for music lessons gave her an uncommon sense of independence for a 10-year-old Palestinian girl. According to May, the conservatory was begun to create a place for music. There was just no music teaching in Palestine whatsoever when they started. She said it was a place with no music. I heard this sentiment, no music in Palestine, from many participants. What they meant was that limitations on movement prior to the founding of the conservatory had made collective music making of any type very difficult, and finding a teacher had been almost impossible. I also noticed over several visits that developing as a musician, whether indigenous, Arabic, classical, or Western music, was once it became available very similar to my own development. The difference lay in what Mohammed had called living the situation, that is, living under occupation. May's notion of a place for music and Mohammed's words living the situation were woven into every story I heard. But everyday life for Palestinian musicers varies greatly depending on the history and culture of the place where they live and work, and also on the realities of the situation at any given time. Thus, over time, I noticed that the conservatory was not the only place that impacted the experience of musicking for Palestinian musicians. We next visit Ramallah, literally hills of God, Ram Allah, this city became the de facto center of Palestinian politics and culture after Israel annexed East Jerusalem in the 1967 war. In the busy shopping district, you are as likely to see a Bedouin shepherd crossing the street with his flock as a foreign diplomat driving a late model European car. Thus Ramallah was an obvious choice for the site of the first branch of the conservatory 
which was established in 1994. At that time, closely following the Oslo Agreement, some Palestinian refugees were allowed to return. This is how Ahmad, born to Palestinian parents exiled in Jordan after the 1948 war, came to work there. Ahmad had studied the Aoud, the Palestinian and Arabic lute, traditionally, and he also had a university degree in cello, making him an ideal teacher for the conservatory. Arriving during this time of relative peace, he did not immediately see a need to obtain the Palestinian ID. So when the conflict known as the Second Intifada exploded suddenly, and people without the ID were ordered to leave, he was so engaged in Ramallah that he defied the order, staying to teach music. A focus of the conflict was a siege of the Mukatta, the compound where then President Arafat lived, which you can see on your screen. This compound was only a few blocks from the conservatory. So during curfew, you could walk on the side of the street opposite the conservatory, but on the conservatory side, you could be shot. Once you were inside, it was safe to play music. So Ahmad would meet a student on the safe side of the street, and after seeing the Israeli tanks pass, they would run to the conservatory for a lesson. Then after the tanks passed again, they would return home. Ahmad acknowledged that this sounded crazy, but he said at the time, I, I mean, we are in this situation. We have to find a way to just like make it bearable. I mean, don't like be scared of it. Just, okay, that's the situation. But we have ooze and we have a life to live. Samer, another oud player, had been one of the first students to enroll in the Ramallah Conservatory. His story up until he became a student of the conservatory is very interesting, but will have to be saved for another time. By the time I met him, he was a teacher and a well-known performer and luthier. <laughs> Samer's song that you just heard, Shuhada Bila Ma'wa, which means martyrs without shelter, speaks to a time when 25 people were killed on the street or in their homes by snipers enforcing the curfew. When the city morgue was overwhelmed with bodies, the curfew was lifted long enough for a mass burial with two graves, one for men and one for women. Sommer performs the song when he travels internationally with the Edward Said National Conservatory of Music's Oriental Music Ensemble, and also on his CD, Khufran, which you can see on the screen. Khufran means forgiveness, and Sommer named it this way to say to these people who died, forgive us, because we are still living, and our life, maybe, is a little bit better. Here we notice places for musicking becoming places for asylum. American sociologist Tia Denora points out that while asylum spaces can serve as private removal spaces where we escape hostility, they can also serve as public refurnishing spaces that let us play on or with our environment, alone or in concert with others. Ahmad and his students and Samer and his band were making what was private into a shared experience by way of musicking. Denora makes an interesting point. She says, using music to establish something as public, whether small, large, or in between, is nothing less than a bid for recognition and empowerment in everyday life. Thus, crafting asylum by way of music making is a political act. The Palestine Youth Orchestra 
was created in 2004 by the Edward Said National Conservatory of Music with the vision of bringing together young Palestinian musicians from around the world. Ahmad, whom we met earlier, was the orchestra's first manager. Performing with the Palestine Youth Orchestra was an important part of many of the musical stories I heard. Mohammed, whom we met earlier, described being thunderstruck at the first rehearsal he attended in Jordan. He said, sitting there and just listening to all this power coming out, it's like being in the middle of the ocean and actually you can breathe inside, but you can see life in the ocean all around the different colors. So he fell in love with the classical music through the orchestra. For PYO violinist Sama, a high school student from Jerusalem at the time of her interview, what was most important about playing with the PYO on their international tours was becoming aware of the message we send out. Sama, who is in the violin section, there's the photo that you see here, originally in interpreted international tours with the Palestine Youth Orchestra, or the PYO, simply as Palestinians playing music we don't have any political message. But that changed after their 2013 performance at the London Proms, when the BBC requested that the Palestine strings avoid group photos at famous landmarks so as not to appear political. That experience opened her eyes to what the title kind of sends out or what it advocates, you know? I didn't know, but I was learning. In my notes about the meeting, I contrasted my experiences as a musician from the US with Sama's. I wrote, normal means to me not having to explain the meaning of the name of your orchestra or defend the name of your state in identifying yourself. It means being able to call yourself with what you want without challenge. Most other national orchestras would have been allowed such a picture without any question of it being political. And so I noticed for the first time that if the Palestine Youth Orchestra was making a political statement when they performed, the performance of every youth orchestra in the world must also be a political statement. But many are too privileged to notice. Our last visit today is to the ancient city of Nablus, the largest city in Palestine. Nablus is home to numerous religious sites that are important to Muslims, Jews, and Christians. And as a result, there are frequent conflicts. During the Second Intifada, Nablus was viewed by the Israeli army as a hotbed of resistance. And as a result, the entire city was under siege. Nablus has been a site for conservatory outreach since 2005, and a branch of the conservatory opened there in 2010. In a group interview, parents told about living as children under siege during the Second Intifada. This meant that, like Mohammed, daily life was about survival, and there was no place for music. They said that many in Nablus still felt that way. Having the conservatory in their city enabled them to provide for their children in ways they did not experience when they were young. In the words of one parent, her father and I are very happy because first, it's a safe environment to place our children in, and it's offering a good space for them to express themselves. And it's also a good place for us to talk to each other when we're waiting for our children. And sometimes we listen to them playing music. This mundane ritual, taken for granted by so many, of transporting children to and from music lessons is an act of musical becoming. As Small suggests, a ritual whose relationships mirror and allow us to explore and celebrate the relationships of our world as we imagine them to be. Israeli ethnomusicologist Neely Belkind has noted that for many West Bank Palestinians, such normal experiences are interpreted as acts of political resistance.
In this presentation, we have noticed the ways Palestinian musicking has impacted interpretations of the music and of the places where that musicking occurred. And we have noticed a multitude of diverse musical becomings that have emerged. One of the tasks of noticing is figuring out the relationship between these becomings. Are they simply a collection of new Palestinian realities, or is there a larger meaning, both in the context of Palestine and of music education in general? Georgina Bourne suggests that it is productive to analyze complex socio-musical contexts, what she calls the myriad socialities of music, in terms of four planes of social mediation. I find Bourne's ideas to be helpful for placing the becomings we've noticed today into a social whole. Summarized for time considerations, I present them along with some of the musicers we met today. Bourne's first plane, which she calls the immediate microsocialities of musical performance and practice, is realized in the immediate aesthetic response, such as that described by Mohammed after his first orchestra rehearsal. Bourne's second plane, the affective alliances that become imagined communities animated by musical experience, applies to the kind of immediate social connection that I experienced during that first jazz concert I attended in Ramallah. Bourne's third plane, music's instantiation of wider social relations, encompasses all of the stories we heard today as it refers to becoming a certain kind of person by way of musicking. And finally, Bourne's fourth plane is realized by the Edward Said National Conservatory of Music, an institutional force that provides the basis for the production, reproduction, and transformation of Palestinian musicking. Bourne's planes are not to be envisioned as figures with clear lines and straight edges, despite my having drawn them that way. Instead, they co-function as a constellation, autonomous yet inseparable. It is this very autonomy, according to Bourne, that makes them vehicles for the exercise of a socio-musico-political imagination. So what have we noticed? We've noticed a variety of musical becomings, a classical musician, an independent woman, a politically aware performer, a crafter of asylum, the kind of parents who want a place for music in the lives of their children, a national conservatory. But ultimately, what we've noticed is this. Musical becomings emerged for these Palestinian musicers when they experienced or crafted or imagined or reconstructed places for musicking across the planes of music sociality. And in this process, places for musicking, places for the exercise of a musical political imagination became places for Palestine. <laughs>